really, really special, special event um, where we're having uh, as a guest speaker a really important labor leader. Uh, he's retired now, but he hasn't retired from the struggle, as he's pointed out. And uh, he was a member for many decades with one of the most powerful uh, unions in the country. Not only powerful in terms of um, the strategic role that this union played in terms of uh, production, but also so political as well, which our labor movement really needs more and more of. And ILWU Local 10 has always led the way in terms of that area of work, which we're going to hear some very historic events that this union has helped to lead in this country for decades uh, against the struggle against apartheid, against police brutality, in solidarity with Palestine, etc. But before I introduce Clarence, and let me just say this in terms of of the agenda, this was really meant to be a you know like a, a informal political discussion because every other Tuesday we've been having political discussion, especially for new people who are interested in the struggle, interested in the party and our politics, our unique view of the world, um, and. In light of that, we, we wanted we asked Clarence and um, if he could come here since we knew he was going to be traveling here and, and hopefully he'll talk more about why he's on the East Coast. Um, you know, take advantage of him being here. And so uh, he was gracious enough to change his schedule along with Chris Severa. Chris Severa, who is Secretary Treasurer of Local 808 of the Teamsters. Local is here. Sister Brenda Stokely, it's like old home week. Sister Brenda Stokely, another leader of the Million Worker March, along with Chris uh, and and uh, Clarence. So it's really a, a great honor to have all of them here tonight. Uh, Clarence is a third generation longshore worker who has 31 years of service in the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, Local 10 in San Francisco. Clarence's activism started in the 1960s as a member of the Black Student Union at San Francisco State College and as a member of the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California. During his college days at San Francisco State, he was part of the leadership of the longest student strike in U.S. history, which resulted in the establishment of the first black studies department and school of ethnic studies in the country, and both still exist today. He has served as an officer in his local and has been a part of many historical, economic, and social justice struggles for the working class and the oppressed. Clarence organized and led such courageous and rank and file actions such as the Million Worker March movement in 2004 calling for workers to break away from the Democrat and Republican parties and organized independently mobilizing and organizing in their own name. In 2008 shutting down all 29 West Coast ports on May Day to oppose wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan in 2010 shutting down five Bay Area ports action for justice for Oscar Grant and, f and jail for killer cops. In 2011 on the 43rd anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King shut down Bay Area ports for 24 hours as a day of solidarity with Wisconsin workers. And also in 2011, shutting down docks on December 12th in solidarity with West Coast Occupy Wall Street. In 2014, port shut down solidarity action for Palestine. May Day 2015, port shut down action for resisting police terror. And on May Day 2016, rally and port shut down in support of Black Lives Matter and the minimum wage demand of 15 per hour. And hopefully, um, <laughs> Brother Clarence will talk about what's going to happen in 2018 in terms of May Day. And as I pointed out before, although he's retired from the longshore industry, he is not retired from the struggle. So after he finishes, we're going to open up the floor for any questions or discussion or comments for his 
after his presentation, and then we're going to have him answer any questions and do a summary after we have the discussion. So please welcome Brother Clarence Thomas, the real Clarence Thomas. Today, and as my mother is fond of saying, give me my flowers while I'm alive <laughs> and not when I'm gone. But I want to just give something to Sister Monica, Sister and Comrade Monica. I was recently in New Orleans along with Brother Chris Silvera in August, and we paid a visit to, to Brother Malcolm Zuber, oh. who is leading the struggle of take them down New Orleans. And Chris Silvera and I bought up every take them down New Orleans t-shirt that we could get, but they've been selling so many of them, uh, we couldn't bring enough for everybody. But I did want to present you with this button. Down with all monuments to white supremacy in New Orleans, and this is a depiction of Andrew Jackson's, you know, this is the centerpiece of economic revenue, revenue stream in New Orleans with Jackson Square. Uh, Robert E. Lee is down. Chris and I had an opportunity to go to see. The only thing that's left is the pedestal. We saw some brothers who were sitting around the pedestal and they said, did you come to see Robert E. Lee? He's gone, brother. Yes, and all of the markings are gone. But this, to get rid of uh, Andrew Jackson is going to be a real struggle. But they're very committed, and I wanted to give you this button. Uh, it's great to be with you all today. And um, I, I want to say something really quick because I'm getting older and, and I have to think of, say things while it's on my mind. <laughs> All those wonderful things that Sister uh, uh, Monica said about the ILWU and its history and, and I have to tell you that with all of that history, since the election of Donald Trump, Local 10 has seen various displays of racist graffiti and symbols of racial terror on the dock, starting with last October. In the way, a form of racist graffiti with the N-word uh, and nooses. And with all the technology, because after 911, Homeland Security swooped in and they said, you gotta have all of these security cameras all around. While the employer can use these, this technology for their benefit, they can't come to grips with using it for the benefit of the workers there. So I wanted to get that out there first because I'm going to tie that in. Um, I was told that there were going to be young people, more young people here, and don't get me wrong, I know there's young people here and young at heart, but I want to say a few things before I get started. For those in the listening audience, Few occupations better illustrate the class struggle, working class consciousness, and the complexity of ethnic racial conflict and accommodation in the U.S. than the men and women who labor along the shore. That's where the name longshoremen derive from. Because years ago with the Clipper ships, all along the shore, and men would congregate to discharge the cargo. For our young members, I want to get a few terms out today. For those that don't know what the word proletarian means, because I may be referring to that during my remarks tonight. The proletariat is the class of wage earners in the capitalist society whose only possession of significant material value is their labor power. A member of such a class is called the proletariat. From a Marxist analysis, proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the, 
capitalist class occupy conflicting positions. <coughs> Since the workers want to get the most amount of money for their labor, and the bourgeoisie, the ruling class, or their proxies want us to work for the least amount. Mm -hmm. Ergo, the class struggle. Young people should also understand the term imperialism. Imperialism is when a nation expands its control outside of its government. It can be done through diplomacy or it can be done militarily. It's important that I mention these things because when we talk about why it is that workers should fight against white supremacy, that will be what I'll be dealing with in the first part of this discussion. Imperialism, a policy of extending a country's power through, through diplomacy or military force. So I guess we could say that we saw imperialism in play when African Americans, when Africans were kidnapped and brought here to these shores to be placed in hereditary bondage and chattel slavery. Why workers must fight white supremacy? I guess the short answer is because it's in our class interest to do so. To not do so allows the ruling class and others to divide the working class by race, color, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and so forth and so on. I guess a looming question for some, not for those of us in this room, I would say, can you have capitalism without racism? If you read Edward Baptist's book, The Half Never Told, Half Never Told, I believe, he provides an answer to that question. The kidnapping and enslavement of Africans was the truthful and bloody foundation of capitalism. The number one commodity in the world was cotton. Sugar, tobacco, that's the foundation for capitalism. Its perpetuation is exemplified through racism, which is a, which is a, which is a social construct the perpetuation of white privilege, whiteness. Now let's get to what it is that longshoremen do, because I think it's important for people to understand. First of all, longshoremen are some of the most critical workers in the global economy. And the reason for that is because the cargo that comes off of these vessels, they are the electronic devices that most of us in this room have, computers, the athletic shoes, a lot of the food that we eat, the cars that we drive, and many, many other things that we hardly ever think of come off of a ship. As a member of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, we represent all 29 ports on the West Coast. The International Longshore Association represents the East Coast, the Gulf States, also the Great Lakes and the Midwest. The ILWU, the ILA, and the Teamsters 
three of the strongest industrial unions in the United States. And if we don't go to work, the supply chain is disrupted. That is the power of the working class. The International Longshore and Warehouse Union was born actually in 1937, after we broke away from the International Longshore Association. But what's critical for people to understand about the 1934 West Coast Maritime Strike? That was projected by what was then called the shock troops of American capitalism, the shipping companies. They said that they were in a fight against Bolsheviks, that this was a revolution. And the reason why they said it was a revolution is because of the things that the workers were demanding. Coastwide collective bargaining and into working around the clock. They were demanding a six hour work day. Yes. But the most revolutionary demand of all was the right to a workers control hiring hall. Because before that, we had what was called the shape up a very demeaning, undemocratic, and divisive system of providing jobs. And what would happen is that the boss, representing the company, would select the men to go to work for the day. And what they would do would be to make the selection of those workers based upon nepotism, based upon uh, kickbacks based upon selecting folks on the basis of their ethnic group. It was very dehumanizing. So when the union demanded that workers have the right to democratically distribute those jobs, you were challenging the power of the boss. That was unheard of. And they weren't going to give that up. Now, coincidentally, in May of 1934, the Teamsters in Minneapolis, Minnesota, had a trucker strike. I don't know, was that coincidence? Serendipity? No, that was based upon the external conditions of 1934 and the Depression. It was also a time when the influence of the left was most evident. The unions that were had the most credibility were those that were led and influenced by the left because that was a challenge. They challenged the company unions. Oh yeah, they can't challenge the company unions. The strike paralyzed all of the ports on the West Coast. And San Francisco was the number one port city in the world. There was a immigrant, not from Latin America, but from Australia of all places. And his name was Harry Bridges. And he was a rank and file leader. Bridges had read Jack London. He had an uncle who had gone to sea because Harry's father was a well-to-do real estate broker in Australia. He thought Harry was going to go into the business. And Harry wanted to be a seaman. He had read Jack London. He had read about, he had read Marx. He understood the class struggle. He had traveled to many ports. 
He had seen the condition of the working class and how men who worked on ships and men who were longshoremen, how terribly they were treated and how dangerous the work was. So, what happened? What happened was a drama that unfolded that shook the entire world. First of all, any time that you stop working, international cargo movement is disrupted. So all of the capitalist forces were lined up, as well as the state. You had the city, you had the newspapers, you had the National Guard, the police department, mayor, the governor, and they were determined to keep those ports open. Fast forward to July 5th, 1934. It's a very important day in our history. It's called Bloody Thursday. And on that occasion, two maritime strikers were killed, shot in the back by the San Francisco Police Department. That led to a four-day San Francisco general strike where the entire city of San Francisco was paralyzed. <coughs> it's unfortunate that this history is not really made available to our young people yeah. in school. Seriously. I didn't learn any of this that I'm telling you about at school. I learned about this when I became an ILWU member. But I will say this, as Sister Monica made reference to earlier, I'm a third generation longshoreman. The first time that I ever heard Harry Bridges' name uttered was at my grandfather's kitchen table when he used to bring longshoremen home for lunch. First time I ever heard Harry Bridges' name, first time I ever heard Paul Robins' name. For many of you who may not be aware of it, Paul Robeson was an honorary member of the ILWU in 1943. Performed at our hall. It's important that people understand how we come about learning about our history. There was so much pressure on the business unionists of the day who were against the strike, even though Hundreds of, it was more than 100,000 people turned out for the funeral procession of these two fallen strikers. They were very reluctant to support a strike, but the rank and file said we're going out. And that put pressure on the conservative elements of the trade union movement in San Francisco to have to bow to the will of the rank and file. To connect the narrative that I'm giving you right now to the issue of white supremacy and how it was challenged during the 1934 strike, let me explain. Not just in San Francisco, but in the South, on the East Coast, when there was labor struggles on the waterfront, do you know who did the work when the unions were on strike? Yes, it was the black community. Because that was one of the few times that we had an opportunity to work. There's a book that I think many of you will find interesting called Divided We Stand by Bruce Nelson, who goes into the analysis of the waterfront, and particularly the Irish, the struggles with the Italians and the black folks and the battles that went on. But it's critical to understand how white supremacy works. Black folks were used as scabs during the strike in 1934. That's how many of them got on the waterfront. They were kept on 
in certain instances. There weren't that many black people in the Bay Area at that time like there were in the South. However, Bridges and the other leftists in the Union realized that they could not win the strike with black folks scabbing. Oh, what do we do? What do we do? Bridges, in his wisdom, along with other leftists, members of the party, radicals, anarchists, they went to the black community and spoke with leading pastors in both San Francisco and Oakland. And they appealed to them to allow them to come to the church. It would be what we would call today labor in the pulpit. <laughs> I've been a part of those kinds of uh, <laughs> actions. Very, very important. I always tell people who are close to the church that I belong to the secular church, <laughs> the union, that allows members to make their tidings. <laughs> All the ministers understand that. <laughs> yes, they do. This is a revolutionary action on the part of the white working class to make this move. But they size up the situation and realize how are we going to win the strike, Harry? We got black people scabbing. The only reason why they're scabbing is because they're not a member of the union. Yeah, exactly. What vested interest do they have in supporting us? So, Bridges went to the churches and was making a very strong plea for the community to support the strike. It didn't happen overnight, but it did happen. We can make the connection between that development in the, in the 1934 strike and point out how W.E.B. Du Bois in his book, The Souls of Black Folk, I believe that's what it is, where he describes how enslaved black people were the determining factor in that victory for the Union or for the North. Many of you may not realize, but there was a point when enslaved Africans during the war were fleeing the plantation. Union soldiers were taking them back to where they came from because they were going to the encampments. But as W.E.B. Du Bois described, when the enslaved Africans stopped doing the work on the plantation, that impacted supply chain. You can draw an analogy between that and black folks scabbing and stopping the scabbing when they knew that they were going to be able to be a part of that union. This is a part of the history of that struggle that is not terribly underscored. And I'm just glad that I'm here to set the record straight. They could not have won that struggle in 1934 without the support of the black community. That was a, that was a strike against white supremacy. The employer uses black people to generate the profits when the union is on strike. The contradiction is, there are not that many black people in the union. See, unlike the ILA, where you had segregated unions, black and white, and let me just deviate for a quick second to show you how even in the South, white supremacy was challenged back in the, from 1899 to 1920. They had what they call cotton workers. And they used a screw jack to handle bales of cotton. Many of you wouldn't know anything about that unless you actually saw workers handling cotton 
and now they're in containers, you don't see it. But you had a black union and a white union, both competing for work, and guess what happened? The white union was sitting in the hall while the blacks were getting all the work because they were working for less. Guess what? The white union said, ho, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not right. We're going to have to equalize the pay so that we are not sitting in the hall and the blacks are getting all the work because they're working for less. Ex that's a, le a leading example of how white supremacy divides the class. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I may as well mention it before I forget, because I am getting up there in age. The reason for right to work is because the South said to the poor whites in the working class, we're going to make sure that, what's that term now? Jim Crow. You won't have to work with any niggas. We're going to make sure of that. We're not going to allow the Jewish conspiracy of communism. They were saying that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was Sovietizing the United States, we all know that not to be true. But they said that, realizing that by not unionizing the workers in the South, they would have a cheaper labor market in the South. That is what drove the whole issue of right to work for less. They used it as a race measure. And you know what? It's still working. I was recently in Canton, Mississippi with the Nissan workers. For 14 years, that particular workforce in Canton, Mississippi have been trying to have a vote for a union. And what happened when they had the vote? They voted no union. It also happened in Tennessee with Volkswagen. It's still working. That's why the working class needs to fight against white supremacy. Now, I'm going to go back to 1934. I ain't lost track of where I'm going here. That four day strike was a come to Jesus moment. <laughs> the union was very strong on not having to go to arbitration. But you gotta understand something. Working class men in the Bay Area who were following an Aussie, who everybody said was a commie, and they took on the state International commerce, state government, city government, the federal government. So they decided to go with arbitration. And while they did not get everything they wanted, the number one thing that they got that impacted every worker in the United States of America was the right to have a hiring hall. Let me tell you why the right to having a hiring hall was a revolutionary act in 1934. It took the power away from the employer to disseminate the work. It also allowed the union to implement socialistic programs. The first thing that the union did was to say, we're going to have a low man out system. The person with the lowest hour would be the one who gets out first. We'll have a start line and a stop line. <coughs> we had collective bargaining 
up and down the coast. No longer was there one port fighting and pitted against another one. In our Constitution, we talked about how we were against racial discrimination. How a member's worth was not connected to the family that they came from, but to their ability. We set up grievance committee machinery. Well, we disciplined our own members. <laughs> Implemented programs to this day that allow for rank and filers to have the benefit of the same kind of health care that Trump, Orrin Hatch, and the rest of them have. We don't pay a dime for our health care. Why is that? Because Bridges and others, when they sat across the table from the bosses, they said, stop with the bullshit. You don't tell us that the reason why you're in business is to give us jobs. Stop lying. And stop trying to confuse my members. You stay on your side of the table, I'll stay on mine. <laughs> you are here to make a profit. And we are here to tell you that if you don't pay us fairly, we're going to shut your ass down. That's the only thing these people understand. Now I want to move on to some things that have to do not just with the pork chops of what a longshore worker does. I'm going to talk about the things that really has made the ILWU world renowned. In 1935, when Mussolini invaded what was then called Abyssinia, wasn't it, Chris? That's right. Otherwise known as Ethiopia. There was a community, I'm not going to call it a picket line, it was a blockade. We were to ship nickel and zinc to Mussolini. Guess what? It didn't happen. <laughs> that was in 1935. In 1939, we were in the process of shipping scrap iron to Japan, who had recently invaded Manchuria. We didn't need a community blockade this time. Bridges said, this material that we're shipping off to Japan, which is a fascist country, we hadn't been brought into the war then. This material could be used on American soldiers. <laughs> when we took that action, there was a letter sent to Bridges by FDR saying, Harry, you need to stay out of matters of foreign policy. You're wrong. Harry's response is, was, that's our right as citizens. We didn't work that cargo. So you can see where our anti-fascist roots started. We actually loaded ambulances to be sent to Spain for the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. That's the kind of union I come from. During the military hunters in El Salvador and other places, ILWU members refused to handle cargo. We refused to handle the grapes that Cesar Chavez workers were picking. We're not going to handle those grapes. The first march that Cesar Chavez ever had in San Francisco, the ILWU participated in that in the mid-60s. International solidarity 
is not an empty slogan. The ILWU believes that international solidarity and a peaceful world with economic and social justice for the working class is key to peace. We have opposed the Korean War, the war in Vietnam, Desert Storm, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan. Now, Workers World, front page. Doctors honor picket. One won't unload Israeli cargo. <laughs> April 14th, 2011. Workers shut down ports in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King's commemorating his assassination and support the workers in, where was it, Wisconsin. <laughs> workers World, front page, December 15, 2011. West Coast Occupy. We said stop Wall Street on the waterfront. <laughs> no empty slogans about we gonna disrupt Wall Street, no. We're going to shut down commerce on the waterfront. We had to fight our own le international leadership on this question. They were serving as proxies for the employer. May Day 2015, front page, Workers World. Dock workers to shut it down on May Day. Protest police killings. Did that 2015, 16, and 17. <laughs> These are just a, a few things that I could get from my archives that were handy. But I want to go back to cover those that I, don't, that I did not bring here today. Sister Monica talked about the question of South Africa and the apartheid. A mentor of mine and a comrade and brother to many people in this room like S Sister Brenda Stokely, Brother Johnny Stevens, Brother Chris Silvera, and there may be others of you in the room who knew Leo Robinson. One of the most important, one of the most important, what I call rank and file leaders of the ILWU in this modern era. In 1962, on a Sunday, there were some community people in San Francisco who came to one of the port's terminals on uh, Embarcadero in San Francisco. And they came there for the purpose of calling attention to apartheid and setting up a picket line. Our members didn't go to work. Our union was very familiar with the issue of apartheid, but there hadn't been any real action taken on the part of the union. But immediately following the Soweto massacres in the mid-1970s, Brother Leo Robinson was so moved by the killing of the South African youth because they didn't want to speak the Africana language. He wrote a resolution calling for the boycott of South African cargo. What, what many people need to understand is that what makes our union so unique is that we have democracy. Where a rank and file can write a resolution. They can submit the resolution to the executive board have them to vote on it. Then it goes to the membership, up to our Coast Committee or International itself. 
He called for the boycott of South African cargo. That was a real bull move. What immediately followed was a ship by the name of the Ned Lloyd Kimberley came to the Bay Area. And I'm going to show you how real socialism on the job happens when you have a hiring hall and the workers control the jobs. And for young people who are listening to me today, we live in a capitalist society where the means of production is controlled by the ruling class. That would be the shippers in our industry. But the workers control the production. Which means, yeah, they control the means of production, but then we can stop it. Or we can change it. We could speed it up. We could slow it down. We got that power if we use it. That picket line that happened that, that day with the community, this is how the socialism started. We got word that there was going to be a picket line at the hall before the ship came in. Leo Robinson and others who were in support of the anti-apartheid struggle, they met with the dispatchers, the people who dispatched the jobs, and they said, listen, there's going to be an action where the Ned Lloyd Kimberly is coming in. We want certain members to take that job. So when they get there, they're not going to work. <laughs> So only the people, only the people who can stand not getting a full day's pay of us if necessary are going to that job. See, that's what happens when you control the dispatch. You see, things are happening that the world doesn't see behind the scenes where the workers control the work. Our employers had no knowledge of what the hell was going to happen. They just, they knew that there was a demonstration. They got out there and saw it. But they didn't know that we had done our part to coordinate with the community to make sure that nobody went out there and who was upset because there's a picket line. Because our members know full well, if there's a picket line on the job, we stand by. We don't go to work. I don't care if you haven't worked in a week. If there's a picket line, you stand by, you call the business agent. The police cannot escort us across a picket line. Why? Because the police shot our members in the back in 1934. This is why we understand the relationship between Black Lives Matter and the labor movement. Because we understand that the police represent the state. Those members went out there. Everything went smoothly. That shit was stopped. That was the first shot across the bow to South Africa. That was in the 1970s. Many of you know, but based upon what sister and comrade Monica told you about 1984 and all that went on. But understand something, that didn't happen overnight. We had a lot of struggle in the meantime with many of our black and white members who question Leo and others. Uh, Brother Leo, what does this South Africa BS have to do with our pork chops, brother? <laughs> Concerned about our contract. And others were expressing the same sentiments. Not just black folks, white folks too. We showed videos. How am I doing on time? Did we show videos? We even brought members of the ANC to our union to speak. We organized the Southern African Liberation Support Committee, which is one of the first unionized anti-apartheid groups in the country. 
were able to explain how Ronald Reagan was using the issue of constructive en what's it? Engagement. engagement. He was telling the American people a lie. If by us doing business with South Africans, we can change things. No, what they were doing was shutting down, corporations were shutting down plants, companies in the United States, and opening them up in South Africa for the cheap labor. So that was the response to the brothers, black and white and others, who said, what does this have to do with our pork chops? You see what it has to do with our pork chops? You got to show the rank and file. Has to explain things to them. We not only didn't work South African cargo for those 11 days in 1984, we also collected humanitarian supplies and sent containers to Tanzania where there was a large ANC base. Now, a lot of people didn't realize that. We knew. So the goods and supplies that we were sending there made their way into the hands of the freedom fighters. We were able to secure containers from our employers. Nice. Many of our employers say, well, yeah, you can have that old container. It's rusted. They think that they're making their contribution to something important. They're not going to do it on their own. That's where the class interest comes into play. See, the working class can make these kinds of demands. We can make these kind of demands right now. We did it for Katrina. We secured a great number of containers for Katrina survivors. I did it myself with the help of officers under the aegis of the Million Worker March and made them available to Congresswoman Barbara Lee. We filled those containers up. And you want to know one thing? Companies like Matson Navigation, who gave us some of the containers, they had their photographer there that day taking photographs so they could put it on their website. We're helping with the relief effort. They think about self-interest. The working class has to make the demand. We secured containers, had them filled with humanitarian supplies, medical supplies, sent them to Mozambique and Angola. Nice. We just didn't stop working. And then we loaded those containers for free. The employer said, we will give you the space on the ship. I guess they might have figured out, if we don't do this, we'll be in the newspapers saying that we support apartheid. We don't want that. I'm hoping I'm making the connection between white supremacy on a real basis, because I'm, I'm telling you about what I know. Yeah. Now I want to go back to some things that only a few people in the room know. Johnny Stephen and members of the Workers' World know about this. Leo Robinson, before he passed away, told me that one day he was listening to KPFA, that's a station related to WBAI, Pacifica. And he heard two black women describe how they were being harassed and terrorized by the Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazis in a little town called Oroville, California. He invited them to an executive board meeting, being that he's a rank and file leader. That's what we do. We invite people in the community to tell us about their problems when other unions won't listen to them. They came. Told their story. What I did not know until a few months ago when Brother Johnny Stevens enlightened me that not only was the ILWU involved in responding to that crisis, 
There was a committee that was formed, made up of people from all over the country. The point of it is this. The ILWU decided, after the sisters came to the union meeting, that we were going to have our next union meeting in Auroville. <laughs> that meant that there was going to be a union meeting in Auroville. When we have our union meeting every month, we don't work one shift. Yeah, that's right. Remember I told you about socialism? Hey, we can't conduct our business when you say you got ships to unload. That's bull crap, man. We're not going to work. We're shutting down for a shift. That's how that goes. Now, we make exceptions for people on cruise ships because we don't want to say that people got to carry their own bags and fall down gangways. No, we will work that. But containers and other vessels, we don't work. We took hundreds of rank and filers to Oroville, and we marched down that thoroughfare with Johnny Stevens and others. Listen, Johnny sent me that doggone article. I, I, I can't find it right now, but be, believe me, it, it happened. I don't know if it's in there or not, uh, 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 comrade, but. I, Johnny sent me a copy of that article. Your guest article? No, that's not it, but I'm, I'm going to keep rolling here. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll find it before, I, before I'm finished. Okay. There must have been 5,000 people who showed up that day yes. demanding from the powers that be to stop the BS. Now, the, uh, Oroville's a small town. Very small, but not that many black people. That was a show of working class power. But we were the only group of workers who did not work. 1981, I live in a place called Contra Costa County. It's a Richmond, which is a working class community. It has a port there. There's Pinole and other places. Many of you who might have been to the Bay Area may have relatives. But in 1981, we had the Klan shooting at our, one of our members there, sniping, Disgusting. burning crosses on the lawn. You know, Local 10 is, is, is a lot different from a lot of unions. You know, like somebody, uh, something happened in the community, brother or sister would come to the, come to the meeting. Because, see, we have a microphone in the middle of our hall for, with chairs on either side. And then there's a podium, a stage. Any member can come to that microphone and talk about issues that concern him or her. This brother was bewildered. He couldn't believe that some stuff like this could happen to him. He was out of the South. But they used to have large... Ku Klux Klan marches and gatherings in Contra Costa County. Yes, in the 1920s and later. Yes, happening. The Bay Area. That ain't the only place. Malcolm X once said, anytime that you're south of the Canadian border, you're in the south. I never will forget that. I knew what he meant. So, you know what the ILWU did? The Panthers were not, they had sort of were on demise in 1981. But there was a lot of people who supported the Panthers. One of our members was David Hilliard, who was the chief of staff of the ILWU, of, of, of the Black Panther Party. He came into the industry four years after my father in 1967. And the Panthers always had a lot of support from the ILWU Local 10. Huey and Bobby Seale would be at our union hall in the morning, selling all the papers that they could sell. When the brothers found out about how Brother Roosevelt Presley, that's it, that was the member's name, 
was being assaulted by the Klan, our own members went out there armed to the gills to protect that brother. We certainly did. Then it didn't end there. We also hired a security guard because you know longshoremen can only go so long without going to work. We work around the clock. So we hired a security company to protect that brother. Oh yes. See this is the real history of the ILWU. Oscar Grant has a lot of meaning for me. And one of the reasons is my baby sister's oldest son, Ryan Coogler, directed a movie called Fruitvale Station. His first film. The killing of Oscar Grant was so graphic and just so dehumanizing and because of these it was captured in a macabre kind of way. But when Oscar was killed, that was in 2009, we invited Uncle Bobby, his uncle, Jack Bryson, who had sons who were on the platform that day and saw Oscar being murdered. They came to the hall on a Black History Month gathering. And what came out of that was that the ILWU said that we were going to fight for justice for Oscar Grant. Now I'm gonna tell you what a real revolutionary movement looks like. There was a great deal of outcry in the Bay Area the, the, the district attorney was dragging her feet. There was a lot of shuffling and bull crapping going on. But I'm gonna tell you what a revolutionary movement can do. When you have the Nation of Islam, members of the ILWU and other labor members, Marxist, Leninists, anarchists, social justice activists, blacks, whites, all in the same room not allowing their differences to get in the way. You see, this is what it's going to take to stop white supremacy. Amen. Yeah. We had a rally in what is now called Oscar Grant Plaza. We shut down five Bay Area ports. Johannes Meserly, that's the killer cop who killed Oscar. He posed a question on the nightly Bay Area News. What does Longshoreman shutting down the port have to do with Oscar Grant? It has everything because now you have labor and not just any labor organization but one that is involved with the movement of international cargo. We have friends, brothers and sisters all over the world, a part of the International Dockers Council, a progressive aggregation of longshoremen all over the world. And when we bring up issues like this, they find it very interesting and they can do, solidarity action is important of that. It's the first time in, the, in American history that labor had taken a position on the question of police brutality and murder. 2010 was also important because as many of you remember, when those nine people were killed on international waters by Israeli commandos, killed in cold blood, for the first time in American history, labor, Bay Area, the Central Labor Council of Alameda County, San Francisco Labor Council, and many, many others, for the first time, took a position against Israeli 
against Zionism. The first time that ever happened. We shut down for the first time the 10th largest shipping company in the world. It's called Zim. One of the largest Israeli shipping companies. And for 24 hours, we did not work that vessel. 2008, we shut down all 29 ports on the West Coast. I spoke many times with Sister Brenda. Around 2002, 2003, we spoke in Washington, D.C. around the question of ending the war in Iraq. I was a member of the U.S. Labor Against the War. She was a member of NICLAW. I went to Baghdad, met with the Iraqi workers, met with them face to face. Bush, let's face this, this war is racist. Yes. I was there and I saw the devastation. Where is all the money being spent for redevelopment of the country? Wasn't happening. I met with the Iraqi workers who told us that things were worse now than they were under Saddam Hussein. That led to the Million Worker March in 2004. That's how I met Brother Chris Silvera. He's one of the longest serving black men in a, move, in a trade union leadership position in the United States of America. Sister Brenda Stokely, Brother Chris Silvera were the conveners of the East Coast of the Million Worker March. First thing everybody in the room needs to understand is that the Democratic Party, as well as the AFL-CIO was totally against it. And I want to tell you something. It wasn't just because we were calling for mobilization in our own name ending the war. No. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about right now that wasn't talked about that much then, it was because the people who were organizing and spearheading this were black folks. Latinx, as you say, Latin, Lat Latinos, Latinas. Latinx. Latinx. <laughs> How dare you make the call, Local 10, without consulting with us white radicals first? You didn't check with us. Every time you have an issue, you call on the black community, you call on Chris Silvera, TWU, Local 100, you call on Brenda Stokely from AFSME. You call on Clarence Thomas from ILWU Local 10, and when it's about the class, we support it. No questions asked. But when black trade unionists make the call, there's questions. Sabotage, which is very dangerous because it led to some very, very dangerous things that happen to people like Sister Brenda Stokely. What happened to her after the Million Worker March? What price did she pay in her union? What happened to Brother Chris Silvera, who had the courage to get his own international president to support the Million Worker March, and then to support the Million Moors movement, and then brought Louis Farrakhan to the TNBC. <laughs> hey, we were at the Million Man March, and for those of you who don't know, that was the largest black labor action in the country. There were black men from all over the country who were workers. But it wasn't defined as such, because when we went, we didn't go representing an organization. But we met with Minister Farrakhan and we said, we want to have a worker's representation for the Millions More movement. Why? Because most working people in this, most black people in this country are workers. That's the reason. 
Dr. King was made an honorary member of Local 10 in 1967, six months before his assassination. He said he felt at home with the ILWU. He said that he learned the sit-ins from the shutdowns in Flint, Michigan, and the UAW workers. He said that the strongest bulwark for democracy was the Negro Freedom Movement and the labor movement. Yep. We're connecting those struggles together, fighting white supremacy. When Dr. King organized the Poor People's Campaign, he was talking about all poor people, not just black folks. That's the reason why he was assassinated. On that and the question of international or US foreign policy, where all of the so-called civil rights leaders stepped away from him. Stay in your lane, brother. I'm gonna wrap it up now. But one of the things that I'm really, really proud of, and it's connecting to the Palestinian struggle. 2014, our union refused to work Palestinian car, I mean, uh, Israeli cargo in solidarity with Palestine, with the Palestinians for four whole days. Four whole days. And not only that, they didn't work any of the ships at the terminal. And when you read magazines such as the Journal of Commerce, they would say such things as, we've directed all of our staff not to do any work on that ship. Because they were afraid that if they did, there would be trouble up and down the coast wherever that ship went. The union paid a price for that. The Zim line does not come to the Bay Area anymore. I heard somebody say good. But that meant lost jobs for longshoremen. No, I'm gonna explain, I'm glad you said that because I, I wanna use that, I didn't point you out now. <laughs> the point of it is, that's what solidarity means. Our members were all hyped up. They were following the ship because they said, Brother Clarence, this is our time to do what the old timers did with regard to the ship from South Africa. I'm going to tell you something else that happened. When that vessel, the Zim, went to Southern California, guess what? It was disrupted. Yes. In conclusion, why should workers fight white supremacy? If we don't, we're looking at another civil war possibly. Don't think that it can't happen. I talked to a sister, said, she said she had been in the South and had been to Klan rallies, but had never been to a Klan rally where people didn't have a sheet over their heads. They coming out. The nooses, we finally were able to get our employer to have a disclaimer after we took an action on the 26th of August when the Patriot Prayer Group came to San Francisco. I guess they got word when the, about the ILWU when we said we were gonna mobilize. There was all kind of phone calls being made to Mayor Lee in San Francisco. There was phone calls being made to our officers. Don't shut down. There was calls being made, I'm sure, from the Port of Oakland to the Mayor of San Francisco that it granted that permit to this alt-right group that pretends to be a free speech group but is nothing more than a front for the alt-right. That's right. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, but everybody knows that I'm retired. I got free speech. But I just want to say this. 
The ILWU is a lot different than it was in the 1930s. A lot of changes. We have a new membership, but they're facing crisis. We need your support on the question of the nooses. And if Colin Kaepernick has a chance to see this video, I'd like to extend an opportunity for him to come to our union hall. Right. Yeah. To discuss issues of fighting white supremacy in the labor movement, which he is confronting. Right now, the, the alt-right is coming out. They, they, were at, uh, they were in Charlottesville, and they seem to be doing like hitting, you know, the war of the flea, that's what we used to call it at San Francisco State, hit and run, you know, coming in, you know, with the bullhorn. They're organized. Um, and, you know, th there may be some nights like this that will take place. I think that, we, you know, we can't stop them totally. But what we can do is that when we, whatever we do, it should be organized. And we need to have diversity amongst us in terms of various sectors of the community coming together. The most important thing is the question of labor. Labor has resources. Where do workers live? They live in the community. So you have to start finding out who amongst you belongs to the Teamsters, who are teachers, whatever the issue, because there's a lot of issues going on in the schools, on the work site, that people need to give testimony to. That's how you can deal with the whole question of dealing with having discussions about white supremacy on the job. And what white folks have to understand is the relationship between race and class. Because what has happened in this country and Brother Saladin Muhammad writes about it very eloquently in a piece he put out called uh, Katrina, the uh, Black People's 911, where he describes how the issue of racism and imperialism and the question of white skin privilege makes white workers believe that they belong to a different working class than the working class that black folks believe in. I'm not bragging, but we're some of the top paid blue collar workers in the country. And that's not because the boss likes us. Right. 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 It's because of what we've been able to demonstrate. And that we pay for the movement of cargo with our lives. We go to job and there's disclaimers that say, this on these premises are known carcinogens that can cause heart attacks. Um, miscarriages. It's right there. And we tell the boss, hey, we're paying for the movement of this cargo with our lives. So whatever you're paying us, it's not enough. Right. But I want to say this. The conversation needs to take place between working people. You need to have labor in the room. So that when you have these gatherings, you got working folks there. And that's also going to mean having some discussion with the rank and file. Someone mentioned how do we start these conversations going. I know Brother Charles, Brother Chris, I can't speak for them. Sister Brenda, they all are very busy. Sister Brenda has grandchildren, so do I. I don't know about Charles. But you can start with caucuses inside of your union. See, because a lot of times the rank and file just need somebody to connect to. There may be nooses and other things going on in other, in other work sites, but they're afraid to say anything. Okay, I want to say something real quick because it's going to help frame a lot of, it's going to help with, 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 with what people are raising tonight. Last April at the ILWU Longshore Caucus, that's like a convention of all longshoremen on the West Coast, we adopted a resolution that said from 2018 onward that we would shut down on May 1st, starting in 2018, for eight hours. What that means is we're not going to be working on May Day up and down the coast. 
It's important for you to know this because you can begin to tell people that one of the most important unions in the United States of America is not going to be working for eight hours in commemoration not just of International Workers Day, but if we want to change the conversation in this country about our issues, if we want to get Trump's attention and everybody and the ruling class's attention, we have to not go to work, not spend money. Listen, I understand the value of, of rallies and marches. They have their place. But that's not going to do the trick. That has to be connected with, connected with something larger. You're going to be building towards May Day where all of our demands and concerns are going to be brought forward. And we need to be talking about this right now. The ILWU can be, you can ride our coattails. Hey, ILA. What are you doing on May Day? You should be shutting down too. One hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. We should be having walkouts. Right. I mean, you know, let me tell you, there's going to be less repercussions for people when there's a mass movement. Yes. Right. Yes. Exactly. And I always tell people, as much as Local 10 has become the darling of the left, and I know many of you or don't feel that way because the, the, the words and the, and, 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 and the uh, statements that have been made about the ILWU with regard to the newspaper, with regards to Port Chicago. There are people in the room who know the history and understand this union. But I'm always telling people that it's so easy for Local 10 to become isolated. You see, that's why we're going to have May Day up and down the coast. But we need to get the word out about this. It makes it a lot easier. You know the longshoremen are going to be shut down on May Day for eight hours? What are we doing? We need to connect with them. With your own demands. Yeah. Uh, I want to tell you, see, uh, uh, Brother Cabral, I'm the call Cabral, is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah. One of his favorite quotes, you know, claim no easy victories, tell no lies. I'm going to tell you something that ain't a lie that's true. It's related to the Jones Act. Uh, in 2005, when the, the IL, when the Million Worker March movement endorsed the Millions More movement, and Brother Chris Silvera invited, invited Minister Farrakhan, and we met with Minister Farrakhan, Brenda Stokely, Larry Holmes, and Chris's son Bashiri, uh, and myself. One of the things that happened was that we were allowed to speak. One of the most profound speeches that was given on that day came from Brother Chris Silvera. When he talked about the Davis-Bacon Act. Now the Davis-Bacon Act is a little bit different from the Jones, but I'm going to tell you what it does. Davis-Bacon requires that when the federal government has public works bills, that goes towards construction, that they have to pay prevailing wage. George Bush set aside Davis Bacon in the reconstruction of Katrina. Brother Chris Silvera spoke to that issue on that day, commemorating the Million Man March. As a Teamster, which has represents some 1.3 million workers, 400,000 black workers. Brother Chris Silvera made the call that the trade union movement need to have an embargo. Is that what you said, Chris, on the South? Yeah, blockade, the blockade, blockade of the South. Now, I just want to say one thing. Now, the Democratic Party were making appeals to the Republicans. Oh, you know, come on, President, please stop. <laughs> they, they were doing that. I'm not going to discount that. But Brother Chris Silvera highlighted that at the anniversary of the Million Man March. What did that represent? The state was watching who was speaking that day. A couple of weeks later, 11 days, 11 days later, Trump says, Bush. Oh, I get the two confused. I shouldn't. I had a senior moment. George Bush rescinded it. Now, why am I telling you this story? We can do it again. 
But labor leaders need to step forward. Chris can't do it all by himself. This time it needs to be coming from the Teamsters. By the way, the Teamsters got people there working right now, driving trucks in Puerto Rico. Yes, they do. That's revolutionary work. You're away from your families. You're facing all kinds of ailments and stuff like that. That's work. That's revolutionary work of a break of the working class. We need to speak up. We need to force our trade union leadership to come out and make a statement. These jokers met with Trump. The building trades. Even Jimmy Hoffa. They talked about issues concerning prevailing wages, and Trump, Trump gave them no commitments on that. Why were they there? We need to call our leadership out. There needs to be pressure from down below. It starts with a resolution. I know re you think resolutions don't mean anything. It does when you have a rank and file, it does. You know, right now, everybody who's in the trade union movement should be asking things of their union. That's what we pay dues for. Yeah. They should be speaking out. These are American citizens. What is this? Is this round two of Katrina? We have to make demands. We have to be willing to make sacrifices. We have to, we have to make, connect the dots. See, that's why I mentioned to you about how important May Day is. We have to lead. You got to lead. If the rank and file leads, the leadership will follow. Otherwise, they're going to be out of a job. So we got to start putting pressure. We got to start making, having those talking points. Remember I talked about uh, labor in the pulpit? We talk about it in the church. Your congresswoman, listen, or, or, or your congressman, and listen, we got some of the weakest black leadership we've ever had. There are no more uh, Adam Clayton Powell's. No more Ron Dellums and others. We got to force these people to do something. I mean, listen, we hold the answers. I have no magic wand. This, regards, this requires some work. And you got relatives, if you're not in a union, you got relatives who belong to a union. Ask to come to the rank, come to an executive board to speak. I have to say, I come from the ILWU where Harry Bridges and others thought it was very important for rank and filers to visit workers across borders. Rank and filers to go, not the officers. So we could have that one-on-one -on -one contact. So we could bring back information Invite them to the union hall. We've had rank and file workers that come from all over the country. And, and especially right now, with the whole question of immigration. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you, you know, we have to stop making nice and start calling things for what they are. Trump is a white supremacist. Absolutely. Make somebody say, prove that he's not. <laughs> they want to go after Janelle Hill for speaking the truth. He is a white supremacist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, so if we start saying what the obvious is, we can change the dynamic here. On the question of, um, oh, on the question of the prisoners. In 1999, ILW Local 10 had a resolution calling for justice for uh, Mumia Abu Jamal. And I'm going to tell you a little story. Remember I told you about our union meetings and how we have our union meetings and we get a shift off? Well, sometimes we ask the employer, we say, uh, we want to change our union meeting date, employer. There have been occasions when they've said yes. There's been occasions when they've said no. But I can tell you this, for the last three years on May Day, y'all want to shut down? No problem. Because they know that if they don't agree and we shut down anyway, right, right. now they got their problems with the shipping schedules. Right, right, right. See, that's the, cl that, that's the point of working class power, when you know the power that you have. You don't want to give it to us? Okay. We can take the day off. Now you got a mess on your hands. You got all these jobs left in the window. The employer agreed to let longshoremen have all of their 
stop work meetings on one day in 1999 in support of justice for Mumia Abu-Jamal. That was in 1999. A new trial, that is absolutely correct. Now this is the reason why I'm bringing this up. We had a lot of debate about, he's a murderer. He's this, he's that. This is what does it have to do? You know what we had to do to remind our members? Do you know Harry Bridges was put on trial four times for allegedly being a member of the Communist Party? One of his cases went all the way to the Supreme Court in the 1950s. Harry Bridges was targeted by the state. There were assassination attempts put out on him. His hotel room and home was bugged. Harry was framed. We tell our members, hey, Harry knew what this was about to be set up. He could have been put in prison. Know your history. Mumia is a journalist. He was set up. This is not the first time that this is that, but many of the rank, many of people in the labor movement don't know their labor history. So you have to be able to show people things. Not only that, but all of the years that Mumia has been locked up, he has faithfully supported the ILWU. And we have supported him too when we've been called upon. Letters to the, the warden, to the governor, with regard to him getting medication for hepatitis. Anything we've been asked to do, we can do it. He's still in prison. And I was a member of the Black Panther Party. And I feel guilty because I didn't get locked up like Mumia. It could have happened. We have an obligation to step up. So, what I say, many of us in the labor movement we got brothers and sisters and friends who are locked up. Some of whom belong to unions. It's perfectly okay to talk about the issue of prison labor. Make, connect those dots. And the Constitution, MS incarceration. It, it, oh, oh, the amount, the, the, oh, oh, right, right. And we were about to, some people were about to vote for Hillary Clinton who, who she and her husband were involved in. Well, that's another subject. But uh, uh, listen, that's how we have to have these conversations. We, got, we have relatives locked up in these prisons and they all not guilty. Frame ups. Uh, why is it now, the state of California and, and Colorado, there's a new industry that has emerged? Cannabis. But Day Day and Pookie, who was out there selling weed on the corner for years, and now they're doing long stints in, the, in prison. But Amber and Brooke and others, they now are in the cannabis business. Our former mayor of San Francisco, Willie Brown, and he's no leftist, he said, but there's something wrong with this picture. How come black folks don't have any jobs in this business? How come we don't have any dispensaries? Mm -hmm. The point that I'm getting at, a lot of our people are locked up on some bogus charges. Right. Yeah. That's, it. That's a working class issue. It is. And we have to make the point of bringing this up to our, you know, we gotta put our dog on union membership, leadership to work. Mm -hmm. You gotta come with some demands and some resolutions. And you don't let up on their asses. <laughs> we in trouble right now. The trade union movement, historically, has been in the vanguard for economics and social justice for the working class. They're no longer playing that role, but they can recapture it. I'm a dock worker. The ports in the United States are really third world ports. We got the worst ports in the country, in the world. It's a double-edged sword, though, because you take a place like uh, uh, in the Netherlands, Rotterdam, where they have uh, GPS driverless tractors, 
Uh, you don't need a driver to drive a container around. Wow. You can be in a remote location in an office with a joystick and you can operate several cranes. Wow. Uh, these are some of the challenges that are happening on the waterfront. Our position is if we're not working, you got to pay us. Nice. Yeah. You have to pay us. Because I'm going to tell you, when the machine breaks down, the mechanics got to fix it. Or there's a manual switch for us to be there. You, you're not going to displace us. Now let me explain something. Over the years with the question of technology, Harry Bridges knew this years ago, and, and we had a strike in 1971. Harry understood something that the rank and file took him a while to figure out. Technology meant fewer deaths, it meant more production, meant greater safety measures. It didn't mean that the danger was removed. But what Harry said is that whatever jobs are recreated, were generated, the longshoremen had to be in charge of those jobs. We're not going to allow you to have somebody in Utah right. inputting documentation on the movement of cargo. That's not going to happen. They've tried that, mm -hmm. including Stevedoring Services of America, which is, the, which is a company that is the largest stevedoring company in the world, one of the largest, and where these hanging nooses has been happening. And three days, a few days after uh, the United States uh, you know, invaded Iraq, they put stevedoring services to operate the Port of Moom Casa in, 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 in uh, 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 Basra. So that's the kind of company they are. But the point of it is that this is a, this is a major, major issue. But fundamentally, what, what do we say as workers? You want automation? Robotics, we, we have to have a guaranteed income. Or workers have to be able to retire at a younger age, work fewer hours. We have to think boldly with our own agenda. That's what the answer is. I don't have all of them, but that's what we got to do. Yeah. We have to figure out how is technology going to work for us? I remember when we were in school, high school, we were told about um, mechanization, automation, uh, cybernation, and all those things. Remember they told us we were going to have all this leisure time? We're working harder, getting paid less. We're on the computer, on the subway, on the trains, working. We have to start making some demands. Is, 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 is this just going to be for the, you know, for the employers, for the bosses to just screw us? That's bull crap. That ain't going to happen. Power can cease to nothing without a demand, Frederick Douglass. And so, I, you know, I don't have no secrets. Listen, there ain't no secrets, but we need to be figuring out. We're going to get paid, okay? And we're going to shut you down and disrupt you. What about our children coming along? Are they going to be able to work for TWU 100? Are they going to have driverless buses? Right. If that is the case, we're going to need to have mechanics on all of those machines. And mechanics, they just stand by and wait until something breaks down. <laughs> they have to be fixed. We have to make sure that those jobs go to union people. Not somebody somewhere else and come in here. Yeah, this is how it's going. The technology has to work in our benefit. That's, that's what we got to start talking about. People have to start behaving like local tent members, wherever they are. That's what it's going to take. It's going to take some boldness.